everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you today from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey. Absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to interview Jacob Cooper, a remarkable therapist and healer who will be speaking to us today from Massapequa, New York. Jake holds a master's degree from Adelphi University and he is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of New York. He is also a certified hypnotherapist who specializes in past life regression hypnotherapy and a Reiki master who has presented and held seminars <clears throat> with the Edgar Casey's Association for Research and Enlightenment, International Association of Near Death Studies, local, national, and international universities on a graduate and undergraduate level. Plus, he has been featured in multiple media outlets. Jake is also the author of a thought-provoking and inspirational book titled Life After Breath, How a Brush with Fatality Gave Me a Glimpse of Immortality, which begins with the astounding near-death experience Jake experienced when he was just three years old that profoundly impacted his life. I was entranced reading about Jake's struggles with school, family relationships, his strict Orthodox Jewish upbringing, and more that contributed to the incredibly challenging road he traveled to become who he is today. I'm looking forward to asking Jake about his near-death experience and out-of-body experiences, his touching relationship with his grandfather, the guidance he received from his spiritually open Aunt Seal, and what his near-death experience taught him about past lives, angels, spirit guides, and the concept that death is a rebirth from crossing over. This is surely going to be a very special interview. Hey, Jake, a warm welcome to Grief and Rebirth podcast. Such an honor to be here with you. Thank you for having me on as a guest. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jake. Truly my pleasure. Let's begin this way. Let's begin with this question. Please tell us about your near-death experience when you were just three years old, including your experience with Jesus and your two spirit guides and what you learned about angels, the soul family, and your past lives. I think this question alone, we could just have the whole interview based on this question, but I have so much more to ask you. <laughs> well, you no, know, September of 1993, I was three years old. Um, it was right before the Jewish high holiday of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement a time in which we are you know, preparing ourselves to meet the creator um, and we're trying to have a, a year of renewal and getting ourselves ready for, for a year of health, well-being, you know, promise to go into the new. Uh, little did I know, you know, I was about to have a different encounter with the creator on a more direct basis versus just through thought or through prayer, you know, in, in synagogue or ritual. Um, and so it, I went to a park with family friends of mine you know, it was a beautiful morning and, but going to the park, I didn't know this, but I had a highly contagious, you know, upper respiratory condition called whooping cough, otherwise known as pertussis, which is more the generic term. Um, and so I had it. And at the time I also, my brother younger than me had it too. And so uh, going to the park, you know, I went up onto a slide and as I was climbing up onto a slide on the ladder, I began to suffocate. And at the top of the you know, wrong of the slide, the, the slide, you know, I had, you know, no breath whatsoever, everything shut down. And that was one of the most frightening, scariest, you know, traumatic moments of my life, which is, we could circle back as to why I do believe it is that I remember it, but certainly trauma, uh, the intensity of trauma was one reason why it was, it is till this day so clear, you know, in my own memory bank. Uh, but due to suffocation, every part of my body, due to the deprivation of oxygen uh, was no longer serving me uh, to the point where almost as if you're trying to start a car and your engine's not working, there was no real point in being you know, in the driver's seat. I had to get out of the driver's seat and look at the engine. And so literally my, my soul or myself or whatever you wanna to refer to as the real me stepped out of my car or my body or the meat suit and started to examine this body and I know they say we use a very small percentage of our brain in life. And at that time, I really understood that fully where, 
I was able to have a lot more awareness of not only my surroundings and other energies around me, but also in the very primal basis of my body and my own brain. And within moments later, I was able to see my own brain deprived of oxygen, understanding the different neural pathways and different parts of my own brain. And literally I felt my brain just snap in half like a large crack occurring right in my brain as if yourself or your soul is plugged into this wall and you just yank the plug out of the wall and all of a sudden you're no longer you know in the wall you're just you know belonging Free. to eternity you're belonging you don't have space you don't have time you're not governed uh you know by limitations moments later i was really allowing myself to feel my own you know self my own soul and i was racing down a tunnel entered the light and really that's when my brain cracked open and God came in, as they say. I was able to have an awareness, as we talked about, of Christ consciousness, of the all omnipresent, all that ever is and ever was, an awareness of countless array of sea of angels that were floating right in front of me, awareness of my own spirit guides, awareness of my karma, as well as dharma as life duties, encounters with my soul family, um, you know, and all this was was made possible from, as they say, you know, to, to find yourself, you have to be willing to let go and to lose what you're holding on to, you know, of yourself. And it was the most uh, beautiful euphoric sensation that words uh, could on a limited basis convey, but can't fully capture. Wow. You know, Jake, I'm wondering if you maybe remember as much as you do, because that was your soul that left your body. So that was your eternal soul that had that memory. And when it returned to your body, you remembered. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, you know, I think really our brain is the filter of consciousness as I experienced once my brain shut down, I was able to open up the doorway and to be into the room of eternity. Uh, but I really think that our brain is just the middle, middle person between the two worlds. Um, and so I think within our lifetime, we we really rely on our brain, then we're finite. You know, everything is kind of limited. Right. But if we're in touch with the deeper tapestries of who we are, there's an infinite component to us that defies conventional wisdom. Um, it goes over the linear development and understanding of our limitations. That makes total sense. And you also, during your near death experience, you say your life blueprint that was being programmed into you was replaced with a new one mm. from what you refer to as God or source. What was the original? Why did it change and what did it become? So what were you supposed, where were you supposed to go in your life? And then after this, what was changed? Well, I think so much of our blueprint is disempowered. We're taught from a very young age that in order to be something, you have to do something. And we're taught that we have to really that we don't know the answers, that someone outside of us has them, you know, that someone bigger than us has the answers, that all of a sudden the body is synonymous with development or evolution and wisdom or clarity. And, uh, you know, I think really what I really learned is, you know, the body is just a, a temporary dwelling place of truth, but it's not the birthplace of it. Um, it's just the filter of our eternity. And so there are old people who are quite young and young people who are quite old, uh, but really, uh, our society, you know, and at least the one that I was living on was really based off of, you know, up until that point, the trajectory was on regurgitation versus imagination, was on, you know, uh, regurgitating information versus embodying. Would you say that would come from your Orthodox Jewish background and all of that? I would say, you know, even just the Western world, we fall, we fall in love with regurgitation of information. True. And not as much of just saying, hey, what do you have inside of you? What's there? And so, you know, that's kind of what I was talking about, this conveyor belt that I was on of the world outside of me that wanted to just, you know, make me into that something that I wasn't versus embodying in what was really there. And so really you know, it wasn't just a human being, it wasn't a human being without a soul, but really understanding that I was a soul having a human experience. Was, and what did it, were you told what you were going to become when you grew up? You know, I was aware of that my purpose was much bigger than a classroom, that my purpose was much bigger, you know, than what I saw in front of me. My purpose was something 
deep inside of me, you know, far more than just the boxes of, you know, the college classrooms. And I think so many people forget that, you know, it's kind of like a conveyor belt robotic situation where we just follow, you know, set of uh, steps to get there, but really we're there to be ourselves. And um, I think a lot of people, you know, get caught up in the word healer. Some people feel that they have to be doing things in order to be a healer. But really to me, the, the closest thing to being a healer is to looking at people through the God lens or looking at people through uh, the, the ability to see the good, the ability to uplift, the ability to be inspired or, or in spirit when you're with someone. Um, you oh, know. that's interesting, inspired, they're in spirit. I like that. So it's coming from that deep place. And so that, you know, when you're comfortable with yourself, when you're connected, other people too could feel that within themselves too. When you're disconnected, there's an awkward feeling and you feel very disempowered in your life. That's true. What is your understanding about the continuity of consciousness beyond the physical body when we die? I mean, you're talking about that happened to you, but how did you learn that death is not an ending, but instead a rebirth or renewal from right. crossing over? Yeah, you know, it wasn't anything that I necessarily would put on the label of learning. It was more of recall or, or remembering. Um, you know, so much of what I experienced wasn't something that I added, but rather getting to the core awareness of what was always there that I might have even forgotten it at such a young well, age. Well, would you say that would be um, from the amnesia most of us get when we're born yeah, and then it came know, back to you? Yeah, when we come up off the ships of the eternal waters and we get to the shorelines, you know, of this body, you know, at times that could happen. Some people drink less or more of those waters of amnesia as, as the Greek philosophers would refer to. Uh, but, but in our core, you know, there's some type of degree of recall within all of us and continue to develop that. Um, but, you know, I, I think really um, I was a lot more empowered, but from looking at that, um, I was really awakened um, and remembered the fact that, you know, in our, in our bodies, we're used to timelines and our bodies, we're used to linearity. Uh, we're used to, you know, worrying about Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, one year from now, five years from now, and so when I went to the other side, you know, infinite or eternity was not a finite uh, principle. It didn't have a limit to it. So everything was like that. Infinite joy, infinite time, infinite awareness. There was no limitation to what I experienced. Where when we were in the body, we sometimes could be quite limited bioneurochemically or within our own minds, within our own linearity, um, you know, kind of awareness, linear awareness. Uh, but really I, I was taught that you know, death is not an ending, but rather a new awakening and remembering, you know, to this eternal uh, journey that we all have, you know. You know, if people listening to this podcast take it, just one thing out of it, that would be the thing to take out of it, that your death is not an ending. It's a reawakening. And it's not it's, over when it's over. It's not something that, you know, you couldn't really fully grasp with the left brain, um, you know, fully because the left brain works diametrically opposite to that. The left brain works on beginnings, middle and endings. And that's how so much of our life is governed. And so to have the juxtaposition of a totally different dichotomy of that, where there is none of that, is something that we have not been taught, but rather something that is in the doorways of our own truth. So it's more like a continuation. Yeah that we have. What would you like to tell everyone about your out-of-body experiences? That's not a near-death experience. An out-of-body experience is different. Yeah. You've had the whole, the whole menu. <laughs> what would you like to teach them about that out-of-body experience? interesting with the near-death experience is that under that umbrella, you do have an OBE, technically, you know, right? You know, so like under that, you have that, but you could have an OBE without necessarily, you know, having an NDE or something having traumatic to your own physio you know, physiological body. But to me, the OBE, I look at it as, you know, kind of for most people, it's kind of like an out of my left brain experience in a way. Because most people are not in their bodies, they're in their left brains. You know, it's like, I ask people to, to, to point to themselves, they'll often point to their heads or, you know, With stuff like that, or, or their heart. But you're, the, you know, right now you have the entire body and so many people aren't fully connected to their full body you know, and so that's why, you know, so much of the other work that I do is really important. It allows the soul not just to be a point of light within one part, but to be fully present 
within all parts of it. Uh, right. but, and, you, and you did leave your body a couple of other times, yeah. right? Yeah, but I was in my early years of college and I just literally woke up, you know, kind of like, um, it's kind of like something that you see out of a movie where I just one day woke up and I was just looking down at my body and I was, I thought I was having a psychotic break. I, I you know, the, the, the fear part of me was in judgment. Uh, but then there was another part of me that said, no, that this is something familiar. There's something deeper going on to this. And I firmly believe when we evolve and develop, there's there's different points of, you know, shakeup periods or just enlightening pockets that we have where we almost need to have a full throttle experience to carry that over to the next stage of our evolution. Um, and, you know, one door closes, this beautiful room opens up. And for me, you know, it was just this homecoming to this truth that, was always there, but I, you know, much like at three years old that I, that I didn't have full conscious 24 seven awareness of, but literally for a number of weeks, I was literally looking down on my body and you know, parts of my body that, you know, I, I just didn't really feel in that great depth were, were there, you know, for instance, I could feel my heart in its full, um, the full experience. I was able at times to feel as if there was like this wetness in my forehead where I keep on taking a tissue and trying to dry it off and there was nothing. Where well, there was literally a full blinking, you know, large eyeball in the middle of my forehead that was slowly opening, wow. closing, opening, closing. It just, my own energetic body was, was opening. It's not like it wasn't, I was becoming something that I wasn't, but rather I was connecting to this body that was always there that was at times blocked energetically really so, with what you really what you getting, what you were what I was you getting, are i was getting in touch with the real mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. uh, without blockages it was just kind of windows without walls it was clear sight clear what a blessing view, no barriers um and then again i was in a synagogue now, normally the synagogue is a place of a little bit of discomfort um not a place that i feel comfortable in you're in a suit and i'm not very eye to eye with a lot of, um, you know, the religious dogmatic approaches towards finding God. Um, you know, God exists beyond the four walls, beyond the donations of organized religion. I think God exists not because of it, but despite of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but for me, I had this experience in a synagogue where I literally was saw my soul flying around the room with like a spirit totem. And I was able to look down on me and I was able to see the silver thread connecting each individual congregant within the synagogue. And so, you know, intellectually, I could, I could learn about swimming until I'm blue in the face, but till I actually go into the pool, that's a different experience. And so that's this amazing. was, this is all that I knew intellectually and was right in front of me. So translated faith and hope into a knowing. Wow. And having that experience, it really taught me that, you know, the ego, you know, as they say, is edging God out and the God part is the light within each other. And I was able to translate into clear sight and clear awareness of a one, you know, being that we're all forever connected to. Where was that silver thread coming from when you saw that silver thread coming from everyone? You know, this silver thread was connecting, you know, the participants. But to what each I other? saw, it was more like energetically, but kind of like by the solar plexus. But what I saw was that people were not aware of the love inside of them and, and the love around them or their true body inside of them and love around them. And that's something that I really, that really stuck with me in a sense um, that I think people, the biggest mistake that people for, could for, you know, forget is who they are, what they are, what they're connected to, which at the end of the day, you know, is just pure, you know, eternal divine love. And, you know, we forget you know that, and if we knew that, we'd be a lot less likely to inflict pain on the oneness that we are. That's so true. In your book, which we're going to talk about soon, you talk about, and it's such an enlightening book, Jake. In Life After Breath, you speak to a soul's purpose and the difference between listening to the voice of intuition and the voice of fear. Could you talk about those for everyone? Does every single person listening to this podcast have a sole purpose? You know, that's that's one thing that I really took from my near-death experience where I had this experience and it just taught me that there was such a great, didn't taught me, but it, it reminded me that there was such an infinite greater awareness, greater intelligence 
far surpassing our own awareness that sometimes we forget about. And, you know, this awareness was, you know, inbred in us, embodied in us before we got here, that there's a, there's a plan. It's not just a frivolous biological material life that we live. You know, we're just here to, you know, just pay the bills and have our pensions and play the material game. Right. Rather, indeed, every single person is made of the same stuff, but we forget that. We sometimes monopolize spirituality with a guru or someone who's, you know, been in Nepal for a period of time. Those are all deep spiritual practices, but at the but at our core, we're all made of the same stuff. Not everyone remembers or is connected to that same stuff. Some people are in the process of involution, which is a process of going away from who you are versus evolution, which is a process of really becoming, you know, yourself and really further developing the God part of you within. That is fabulous. That is quite a quote. I'm going to keep that in mind. That, it's not my quote. Um, Edgar Casey spoke very heavily oh, about my evolution versus, you know, involution. And so I think um, a lot of these transformative experience are for individual and collective basis. If we were meant to be born on a stranded island, we would, but we're really here to have a ripple effect, which is much contrary to the material world, which really just says, take, take, take. But at the end of the day, what's left from your existence, what's there, you know, you can't have your home behind the hearst, you know, so. Right, so in other words, in this lifetime or any lifetime, we come here and those of us who are evolving as opposed to going backwards, the involution, those of us who are evolving are supposed to are supposed to have a ripple effect on other people to help bring other people along, right? Some people Hopefully. go away, you know, if if life isn't being your teacher, you're not listening enough. You know, sometimes uh, the linearity of a teacher and the upper trajectory is there, but also the downward trajectory of what not to do is also a teacher too. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's all a part of a, of a, of a learning plan. That's amazing. And tell us about the voice of intuition instead of the voice of fear. I am sure many people listening to this podcast mostly listen to the voice of fear. And God knows with what's going on. God knows with what's going on in the world today. There's a lot of reasons to have a voice of fear. Right. I think so much of that is getting to the still waters of your of your core. Um, within my book, I've made a quote by Thich Nhat Hanh. Highly recommend checking out his work. But he said, within the still waters of the mind and the heart, truth will present itself. And so I think really when we're able to quiet down a lot of the outer ch chatter, and not necessarily quiet down the mind, because the mind always does its work, but to have an awareness of that and to really allow ourselves to really get a little bit more quiet within our own awareness, we could be able to be a little bit more intuitive. Um, whether that's on a micro or macro basis. By that, I mean, if that's on a personal or more of a grander basis where we have these downloads about reality, you have downloads about consciousness. And so I think there's many forms of intuition. It's not just, I think a lot of people think of intuition as just being a psychic, but, you know, authors are intuitive, you know, people who speak on a, on a broader scale of consciousness are intuitive. So there's a micro and macro there's a smaller and larger degree of intuition, but I think we all have downloads. It's always this, this, this whisper of wisdom is always there. We just have to learn how to trust the streamline and flow of consciousness and allow that to allow the tire to be put on the pavement, to allow what we know to be put into place. Because I do believe in all of us is a pure divine knowing, but it's about the application of that, which what we know which will lead to transformation, evolution, growth. Wow. So you're saying like where a lot of people, they don't listen to their own inner wisdom. They listen to the outer voices. Right. Okay. Right. And, and, you know, that's not to point fingers. That is something that we were programmed from day one. From day one, we signed the classroom. Day one, we were taught, you know, our parents or teachers or people bigger than us were, were all knowing omnipresent in a way. It's true. And that's not true, as we know you know, the kids are often the wisest because they're here from the other side and they have a lot more clarity than a lot more adults, you know, who have gotten world weary or just very away, you know, from the inner wisdom within. And so I really, if anything, you know, any listener watching, you know, the spiritual path is really about empowerment, you know, and it's really about honoring the stillness within. It's not about judging that. 
And, you know, really what I learned uh, from my NDE in so many ways, and this is, you know, parlayed a little bit more in my other book is, is um, love is eternal. We are eternal. And as A Course in Miracles says, what's real can only last. What is not real, you know, cannot last in a way. And so only only that which is real could last. You know, something like fear, anger, strife, and all those things pass, run their course. But at the end of the day, we're all a part of this grand ocean of love, and we have to come back and return to that awareness and that embodiment within our lives. Wow. Okay. We're giving, you're giving a lot of people a lot of things to think about here, Jake. And, and you t- already touched upon the change from your Orthodox Jewish upbringing to a more universal consciousness. Is there anything else you want to add about that? Yeah. You know, I think so much of the, the spirituality and religion has to do with that's what's happening right now. Astrologically, we've entered uh, the Aquarian age, which I know a lot of people are familiar with the fifth dimension and the age, you know, uh, age of Aquarius song, you know, back in the day. Uh, but the Aquarius comes out of the Piscean age, and the Piscean age is really about organization, you know, control and, and structure, um, and sometimes could be a little bit disempowered. Versus the Aquarian age, as a very much of a free, liberated, you know, awareness, um, and it's and it's a lot more expansive and innovative, and something that comes from a higher dimension. Uh, if you think about it, everything that we're experiencing was once imagined before. Everything. Technically, the computer that we're on, the, 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 the couch behind you, was once at some day imagined by someone else. So technically, imagination is our reality. But people forget that. We think that regurgitation is reality, but it's not. The world that we're living in is the world of the dreamers, the world of the imagination. The that, is, that is reality. And we have to get back to trusting that voice, trusting that pull, and really acting on that wisdom and that imagination to really allow our lives to, to go forward within that trust. It sure sounds like that structured um, upbringing you had was, you, you grew way past that. You right, you know, it's at the end of the day, if I'm inheriting a set of belief systems, I'm a leaf in water. If I'm generating my own current, then I'm really making a difference. And I think so many people, you know, are just inheriting this belief system, generation, generation, and that's their thing. But how are you making your, your imprint? You know, how is it personalized? You know, it's very much collectively based versus you know, individually personalized. I always say the song has been sung, the dance has been danced, but nobody could sing it or dance it like you. And that's true. That's you know, fabulous. And you're there for a reason to sing it or dance it your own unique way. Yeah. Wow. All right. So talking about some P two people in your life who were here to sing it and dance it in their own way, who had a tremendous influence on you. Tell us about your grandfather who unconditionally loved and mentored you and taught Seymour taught you about seeing more than what meets the eye. And then you had this amazing spiritually aware Aunt Seal who guided and inspired you and taught you about being governed from the inside out instead of the outside in. So tell us about them. The two big blessings in your yeah. life. Well, you know, my grandfather came from a different angle because as a parent, you know, as we know, you're, you're with the kids day in and day out. And so unconditional love might be a little bit more challenging, you know, to kids because they're, you know, day to day. You know, but as you know, as grandparents, we try to perfect what we did with that with our kids and try to evolve that. And certainly my grandfather was a prime example, whereas a, as a parent, he might have been a little bit edgy, a lot of, you know, a little bit harsh, a little bit difficult. Uh, But then he was in, you know, the afternoon of his life, he was in that place of pure enjoyment, pure love, and he really evolved throughout that time. And I was very lucky enough to really be in his presence in in those last couple of years of, you know, just just enjoyment, just bliss, you know, the work has been done and he was able to just... He just enjoyed you. But one thing I really learned from him, you know, and, and I think for parents is, you know, minute to minute, there's a constant evaluation of our kid and their behaviors. You know, if you get that good grade, we love you. If you don't, we don't. So it's no wonder that a lot of people have a very large degree of insecurity of self. We're constantly used to being edited or self-evaluated about what we do versus who we are. Absolutely. um, I think my grandfather was, you know, a real spirit guide because I think the angelic world doesn't look at you minute to minute and judge you, but rather they see the light within you and they love that light for that light. It's that spark within. And 
someone once was once talking to me and says, how could you doubt yourself? If you do believe that you are a part of God, then technically doubting and limiting yourself would be to limit and doubt God, you know? So wow. profound, but, but he was someone who really looked up at me and not down on me. And um, what I loved about him is just, he was such a free thinker um, and he wanted to get to the root, to the core. And he wasn't there to, to pass judgment or to get angry. You know, but rather to really come out of play of a place of understanding, wisdom and and love, um, and harmony, versus the ego, which which seeks to be right or wrong. I'm bigger than you. You're the kid. I know better than you. Uh, versus the soul, which really seeks to unify, seeks to harmonize. You know, relationships. And, yeah, sounds like he was a real role model to you. And now let's talk about Anne Seal, the lady who taught you inside out versus outside in. Yeah. Let's let's hear about Anne Seal. Yeah, it was, what's funny, she was a Virgo born a couple days ago, and it's her birthday and continuation day on the other side. Uh, she was someone who taught the blind, you know, to you know, to really be a part of this world. She was a teacher for the blind. Wow. One of her students was Jose Feliciano, the singer, Feliz Navidad. And so she's gotten tons and tons of of of, of letters throughout her lifetime about all the lives that she changed and at her funeral. You know, there are all these people with vision impairments, but they were sobbing, crying, you know, from just the, the impact that she had. And, you know, in college, she, you know, there were students who wouldn't be able to pass the class and she would tutor them to the wee hours of the moment. So whenever you were stuck, she was able to see, um, you know, and when you weren't able to see, she believed in that anyone could see clearly now there was a path, there was a way. Now, no one was ever trapped. And that's very symbolic of the near-death experience. When I just had this degree of suffocation, I was, a look, I was able to look at the lowest abyss of experience that you could have in the body to see past it, to really remember that only eternal love is real. Everything else is just a distraction or just a turbulence, but that's all that lasts. But she was someone who really mentored me and she gave me all the spiritual books to read at, you know, in my teen years. And you know, she was into the metaphysical stuff. She could what have written. I think she was. She was really reading you and seeing yeah. you. She was so bright. She could have been, you know, and she could have been a new age teacher with books with Hay House if she wanted to. Like she really was. But she more liked to do this on, on the private. She didn't need the glitz and the glam. She wanted to help people when no one was watching. And, you know, her phone calls would last the wee hours of the morning. But I, I what I learned from Seal and grandpa, when my grandfather was that angels don't, aren't just there with wings, you know, on the other realm, that they come in the human form. And we all have guides within our lifetime who are contracted, who really have a deeper knowing of, of who we are and what our purpose is and their involvement within that purpose, which is more of just a biological, emotional, psychological influence, but rather, you know, undeniable spiritual tie within, you know, each person, a part of the soul family. That's, that's wonderful. I've met a few earthbound angels myself who've helped me in my life. I can totally relate to that. And as a psychotherapist, you work with individuals, you work with groups, you work with families, hmm. and you manage emotional barriers. So tell us what an emotional barrier is. How can it be managed? And how does a person's life improve with the help of psychotherapy? And you're talking to the choir here because I have had psychotherapy in my life and it was invaluable changed so much in my life. So I'd love you as a psychotherapist to share your wisdom about that with our audience. Absolutely. You know, I think as a hypnotherapist, psychotherapist, 85% of our lives, they say, are not um, spent with thoughts that we are immediately aware of. They're governed by something called the unconscious mind, which is, you know, just like this, this reel of thoughts that we're not always aware of and all these ideas, perception of ourselves that we're not aware of. You know, so technically our reality is governed by this reel of consciousness and streamline of consciousness, you know, that we might have inherited about ourselves, which could be very limited, which could really interfere with our ability to be all that we truly are. And I think really it's important to understand that every behavior, every pattern has a point of origin, has a point of entry. Um, things just don't happen randomly. And so certainly as a, as a psychotherapist, I do believe in visiting the deeper rooted uh, thoughts, um, perceptions, uh, belief systems, which might get in the way of our behavior. And so that everything is really um, within the high gear or allowing ourselves to take in the high road 
of our life. Many times our lives are taken on the lure road from a lot of those thoughts, perceptions that we're not aware of that are getting in our own way of creating the life based off of what we might have inherited or limitations versus a degree of unlimited um, potential. And so mm -hmm. I think really it's, it's to make the unaware aware. Right. So that's what you do. You help people to find out what's cooking with them under the surface, basically, and to make some choices about that. Yeah, a lot of it. I have anxiety. Well, you know, you don't just have that for no reason. There's a lot of thoughts, which, in, in, you know, you, it's very hard to have a feeling without a thought. You know, so we have all these thoughts that we're not aware of and all these downloads that we take on on the environment or within our own family. Uh, but at our core, uh, we don't come through life like that. We come through, obviously, with some memories, subconscious memories from different carnations. But at our core, we're pure, infinite love, infinite wisdom. But sometimes we could get very much in our own head or we can inherit a lot of different perceptions of reality that are very different from the deep uh, inner being that we are. I can totally deeply relate to every word you just said from my own personal experience. Tell us about some of our past lives and how they're significant to the current life we are living. And would you like to relate a story of someone whose past life led to insights and aid in healing? I'll bet you've got a few in his or her life. Yeah. You know, I, I use the term past life, but really having the NDE, you know, it's kind of like taking a bucket out of the water and trying to think that that's going to make a difference within time or within the, the total volume of water. And so we try to top chop up the infinite into finite, but really we're on the other side, you can't chop that up or divide that. You're just in infinite awareness. There's no division of it. There's no separation of it. And so it's all unfolding almost as one, which is something that we really can't understand. So you think we have many different lives at the same time? It's, I think it's, it's all unfolding in a lot more of a deeper way than we're, we're aware of. You know, time is not, you know, separated. Time is just one, uh, which is something that you probably need a hallucinogenic to have a full understanding of, but I don't want to actively promote that <laughs> <laughs> the program. But for some people, if it's in a supervised setting, you know, I, I, in the last stop on the train, it might have, you know, some, some differences, but obviously there's a lot of, um, dangerous to it as well too and everyone has to use their own caution mm -hmm. uh, but but i do believe um you know we're, we're here to really continually express and evolve what we carry over within our karma within our own you know life and you know what we have what we're here to work on and within our own dharma within our own soul's purpose which are both hindu kind of kind of terms and so i think really it's about having the expression of what we want to feel, what we want to experience. We're all here to have different ways of expression of the divine. And I like what, you know, Holocaust survivor and Nobel Peace Prize winner Eli Wiesel said, God created man because he or she likes stories. And we're here to really have different experiences, different right. stories. So give me a story of someone who you helped to understand a past life, quote, close quote, experience that aided their healing. I think a lot of my clients, it's um, they come through like entertainment purposes or to work on family dynamics, but just so much of them are able to look at their own family dynamics and understand that, oh, you know, so-and-so is a lot more than just the presented of the iceberg. They're there really to fulfill their own roles. Everyone is, you know, life is just a stage. We all have our different roles. And so the understanding from different lifetimes, some of the symmetry and some of the same dynamics are there. Uh, but I think if you're able to look at the University of, of Virginia, they have so many different case studies. I mean, just for an example, you know, I think um, the most respected passive regression, you know, practitioner, one of them, you know, you know, Yale trained psychiatrist Brian Weiss, you know, has a daughter who is a licensed social worker and and one of um, his presentations, she was about to go through cataract surgery. She had difficulty seeing. And obviously, as you know, when you have a parent, you don't look at them in the professional way. You know, that's kind of like his thing. You just have your own personal dynamic with him many times. It's, you know, th there's boundaries to their professional and their personal and private lives. But she's finally decided to attend one of the seminars. And she found that she was burned in the eyes in one of her past lifetimes. Oh, wow. Now was a, you know, and so that lifetime was repeating itself on a cellular memory basis, you know, which was happening in this lifetime. And so when she had that, she was able to see clearly now she didn't have any 
vision impairments. It, it the, heals her, the, the, uh, the, the realization heals her eyes. On the spot. And so wow. not only on an emotional basis, on a spiritual basis, but also physiologically, sometimes we hold on to different traumas and different memories oh. that repeat themselves within our own cell memories, within our own cellular bodies. And so I think really it's learning the technical terms of, okay, that was on the last CD. I'm here to get the CD in the groove within this lifetime on this song, not playing other songs from other right. lifetimes. I mean, I know that there are healers who will actually heal issues from past lives. I'm sure you do that too. Yes. As yes. they come up, which is wonderful. Now your book, I have to tell you, I loved your book. It was Thank fascinating. You. It was wonderful. I couldn't put it down. And I really recommend it to everyone who is um, listening, watching right. us. So what would you like everyone to know from you about life after breath. And you also have an upcoming book titled The Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. What would you like to tell us about each, which I'm sure, and by the way, you have to come back so that we can talk about the wisdom of Jacob's oh, Ladder. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope to be around when that's around too. As we know, as authors, you know, writing a book, you it's know. I tedious, it's, I know. It, it's once you think it's done, it takes another 10 months, a year. Right. You know, and, and it's never done. The book goes through, goes through many carnations, but you know, life after breath, um, I do believe having whipping cough in 1993, I saw so many similarities and so many parallels with the current uh, public health, you know, issues that were happening at the time, you know, where I said, geez, um, this is a book that needs to come out right here, right now. And I, I just, something, there was a knowing that felt that in me. And so from losing the breath of the body, I was able to tap into the eternal breath of creation, the breath that God birthed us with, or as in Judaism refers to it as Ruach or the wind of God. And so when we lose the breath of the body, there's a breath of spirit that's that we are always connected to. And that's the breath that God, you know, created us with, and that can never be taken from us. And so I think on a literal, allegorical, metaphorical basis within this last year or two, in one way, shape or form, we had our breath taken from us. And so within mm. those times, we have to really tune into a deeper breath. We have to really tune in to a deeper part of ourselves because the breath that we were breathing and what we were experiencing was not the ultimate awareness, was not the ultimate state of consciousness, was not inhaling our own truth, was not you know, allowing us. And so hopefully within the Shika period, we are be able, we'll be able to have a solid foundation with all these winds coming our way. We could have a solid foundation to withstand time to translate you know, adversity into meaning and purpose as so many of the sages have been able to really express and embody throughout history. And so it's not what's, it's not the narrative that we walked into, but finding ways to define the narrative. And I think people all have the capacity to really do that, but really has to come from a foundation. So, the, so you think we're in a period of shakeup th that, that's going I, I to think end up with a great deal of meaning and purpose? Under, undeniably we haven't seen something like this in a hundred years and i think there's something whenever this is happening on such a global scale there's something to it um there, there's always a purpose behind everything but this is right in front of us undeniable so life after breath was really given back um what i was given when i was breathless when i was lifeless you know that breath of air you know from god and that reminder of that eternal breath that i was given from the onset of my creation and it's really about giving back when people are feeling paralyzed and people are feeling um, as if there is no hope, there's no way, there always is. And what's inside of us and the breath inside of us is infinitely stronger than the suffocation around us. And I experienced that in unliving wow. embodiment of that. And so people have to remember that. I have to say everyone, if you're going through whatever you're going through, this book is gonna be a comfort to you. It's a great read. And what are we going to learn from the wisdom of Jacob's Ladder, which is in the middle of its 80,000th you know, yeah. change right now, I'm sure. And, and, uh, and, and people forget much like your book, I mean, my book, you know, everyone says, okay, my book is great. But what I heard is that it's funny. And that's, that's, that's the greatest compliment I've ever gotten. Because really, when you're in a state of joy, when you're in a state of laughter, you know, that's like seeing the sun in a cloudless day to truth. You know, seeing truth with laughter is very easy. It's very seamless, you know. And so I think for people to really find the truth, get into a state of joy, get into a state of laughter. It really truth is a lot easier to access when things are lighter 
It's a lot more difficult when things are dense. Um, you know, our vibrations are a lot lighter. We're able to see a lot clearer now when we're in a state of joy. Uh, but the wisdom of Jacob's ladder is really about shifting um, ladders. I think we've inherited a ladder in this life from the day we were born, which is this ladder that we have to climb up a different set of stairs uh, and this material ladder that we're kind of taught that we have to, in order to do something, we have to climb up this ladder, you know? And so really this ladder is about shifting the ladder of the ego to the ladder of the spirit. You know, the ladder really is really about being here yourself on each step of the journey, but understanding each part of your life as an opportunity to really embody this knowing in different parts of yourself. So they're not becoming what, what you aren't, but really embodying who you truly are the divine place within. And so you're, you're evolving, you're not going through involution. So you're getting past the material ladder and going into the embodiment of the true ladder within coming back home. And so they, you don't have to wait till you die to get to the light, but that light could be felt at each rung of the ladder. So eventually you don't need the ladder. You are the light. You're you are the light. And we're, Jake, you and I are certainly work, trying to work on that, aren't oh, yeah. we? We certainly are consciously. Um, Tell us about the value of meditation. And I know you have meditation and mindfulness seminars. Tell us about that. And how can people with busy, busy, busy schedules who are always doing fit meditation that focuses on being instead of doing into their lives? I think a lot of the issue is when people are doing, they're not really doing. You know, being is the ultimate doing. You know, for instance, when you're doing and you're not really there, you're just... Um, on autopilot, you're not present. So, mm -hmm. you know, mindfulness meditation allows you to be two feet in a room so that you're present within the moment. You understand that the present is our greatest present, but so much of life is not really lived. And so I think meditation allows you to live while you live. And so many people, they die before they die. And I think that's a problem is they're not fully there. They're not fully present. You know, they're not fully connected to the full throttle degree of experience. And as, as, as I said before, um, a lot of people feel very empty after hearing a near-death experience or someone who've had all these transformative experience. I mean, obviously there's a lot of anecdotal evidence behind what we speak of, but they have an experience it themselves. And so as Thich Nhat Hanh says, within the still heart, the still mind, the truth will present itself. And, and so I think meditation is a great way to develop rapport with eternity. When you're meditating, there's just, and the more you do it, there's just this part of you beyond thought, beyond time, beyond emotion. And you're able to step into this place of eternal awareness where you recognize, you know, it's just kind of like what I call the observer of life, the observer of the soul. You just recognize that that's not produced by my brain. That's not produced by my body. This is me. This is who I am. And I just recognize that you can't take this away from me. You know, this is just filtering itself throughout the body, but I know you know, that's tapping into my deeper reservoirs of myself. And so when I had my near-death experience, it was a, beyond this limited three-year-old, it was just the depths of the waters of, of myself and my eternity. And so when you're meditating, you're going past this place that, that you just know undeniably you'll carry with you when you, go, when you cross over and there'll be even a more of an awareness of what's inside of you, what's around you, but you could carry it within your life. So now when you have these meditation and mindfulness seminars, if anyone listening to us wants to, after getting to know you through this interview, they would like to participate in your meditation and mindfulness seminars. Are they online? You know, or do they um, have to see you in person? I, 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 am, I am working right now on developing a Zoom mindfulness group. So please stay posted. But oh, you, do, you have to let us know because we'll I, let everyone know. I, I do mindfulness one-on-one -on -one sessions, you know, private sessions. I okay. Past life regression sessions. You know, I do consciousness consulting, psychotherapy sessions, um, you know, Reiki healing sessions, which is a whole other thing that we didn't get into. But right. that, really, that, that really is about healing. You know, Ray is universal and key is energy, so it really allows people to really get... Um, in the place of healing and openness to the, to the healer within and really allowing a lot more flow with their own subtle um, energies to come into their life. Uh, but I am working right now on developing a mindfulness online group, which is really what we need because the world that we live in is very mindless. It's very not connected. And um, as Jesus would speak about when the winds are the strongest, that's when we need our foundation to be rock solid. Absolutely. So um, you know, it's what's needed. Uh, that's great. Well, you know, Jake, um, 
I'm going to have you give everybody the best way to connect with you because I'll bet you have a way. Do you, do you send out newsletters and all that? So when this is developed, people will know about it. And you yeah. can, of course, let us know here at Grief and Rebirth Podcast, and we will let everyone know about that. Right. So, um, so <laughs> by all means, I'm going to ask you two questions now. Why should people listening and watching this podcast want to heal? their issues from whatever has gone on. What is the importance of healing? Mm. And tell us all the ways people can connect with you. Mm. You know, healing is something beautiful because healing really allows you to feel more like you. I look at all of us as hot air balloons, but when we have these uh, weights in ourselves, we're not able to ascend to um, fly off and to be, um, you know, our true selves in a way. Um, and so it really allows you to be like a full unencumbered expression of yourself. I think so many people lose sight of that and that's when life gets dull because we're not connected to our true self but rather we're connected to all that that's weighing us down. And so you know, healing really allows us to get really more in touch with ourselves. And it starts with that shift. You know, the moment that we're able to see and, and feel you know, and touch that, that divine spark within you start to find ways to have a task because to see it in the world around us on the inside and the outside. And so all of a sudden we look at life as an opportunity to really see, you know, the seed of God within all of things and to give life meaning versus feeling a victim of life and feeling very powerless in life, you know? And so really it understands that life begins from really our ability to process or really ability to connect it's got very little to do with the series of narrative events, but as I said before, our ability to engage with those narratives and that keeps life exciting where every day is an opportunity to fill that space in between, you know, with a different energy, with a different space. But ultimately that's where the, the influence and control happens. What happens outside of us is, is, has never been more out of, out of control. And so if anything, it gives people a lot less anxiety in the knowing that only that I can control is what's in front of me and, and my ability. And so attitude is everything. We want to choose a good one. And we also open ourselves up to infinite energies around us and infinite awareness to really allow this life to be um, a life that's within flow, a life that's within meaning, a life that's within purpose versus a life that feels very much disempowered, victimized, or, or, or bottled, boggled down. John road them. or whatever, right. Yeah, it's the growth mode versus the victim mode. And so I think that's where we have to. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I, I've personally experienced that. Um, how are the many ways that people can connect with you? Now they want to buy your book. They want to go to um, your seminars. They're waiting for your Zoom notification. Yeah. Let it rip. Yeah. We're, we're doing it at the right time because right now it's a Virgo season. And Virgo is really about organization structure. You know, everything has to be in order, professionalism. Uh, but but uh, right now, for people interested in contacting me or looking at events which are going to be uploaded, you know, to come, they could view my website at jacobelcooper.com. You know, slow down, J J A C O B L C O O P E R dot com. Yeah, jacobelcooper.com. Uh, that's my website. You know, as well as once you're on the page, you could connect on my social media you know, pages through Instagram and Facebook. You just click on the, the Instagram icon, the Facebook icon, or my phone number is there, or the contact me option is there. So my website is really my primary source of, of traffic and connection and ways for people to follow myself. Um, and so, you know, stay posted because we are working in the process of doing a mindfulness Zoom group. Um, I'm very old school. I look young, but I'm very old school. So I'm just getting <laughs> up to times with all this technology state. Uh, but it's just such a beautiful gift where we could speak to someone in New Zealand and they could be right in front of us and we could feel we could touch them, you know, right across the screen. And it really does speak to the oneness that we are where there's no separation in technology. How do you like this here? We have Massapequa and West Orange, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here we yeah. are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We just click end and you, know, but you could be a 26 plane ride away and you click end and then that's it. So. That's it. Tell me the Jake Cooper tip for finding joy in life. It's a good one. I think really it's, 
it's it's really about being in the present, being in the moment. I think a lot of um, things that happen in our life that are taken away from that happen right in between our own two ears in the separation between the brain and the heart, which is a couple inches apart, but could be miles away. Um, life as it is, as it unfolds, you know, is a beautiful thing. You know, the sun does not judge the moon or say, hey, you're, you're a little bit too hot or whatever. The mountains don't complain to the rain. You know, it's really about saying, okay, this is what it is and embrace it things for they, for they unfold. Um, you know, I like that quote that said, um, you know, who judges a sunset by its imperfection? We just allow it to unfold as it is. I forget who said that. It might have been Carl Jung, but I, I forget at the time. But really, it's just allowing about things to just unfold as they are and to not have as much judgment, understanding, you know, that, that when we're in the moment, it's pure joy. It's what takes us away from that within our own judgment, the editing of life, you know, that might take us away from that true awareness. But at, but at our core, when we burn everything away, that's what's left. Uh, Wayne Dyer would say, if you take an orange and squeeze it out, what's left is orange juice. Now, if you take yourself out and squeeze it out, what's left? And I think for a lot of us, we could have a lot of different things, but at our core, what's really left is pure joy and pure love. And so it's not trying to find something outside of ourselves. It's really being in symphony, in okay. harmony with the music within, with the it's instrument. Within. So that's wonderful, Jake. Well, my goodness. I'm going to talk about two of my favorite quotes from your insightful book, Life After Breath, How a Brush with Fatality Gave Me a Glimpse of Immortality. To me, being spiritual always meant seeing past face value and looking at life in a deeper and larger context. Mm -hmm. And I also love this one, Jake. I looked up at the stars in the galaxy mm -hmm. and became aware that only in darkness could I see the light of their beauty? Through darkness, I remembered the eternal, infinite light that shines deeply in each of us in any season, in any situation. Right, right. Many in our Grief and Rebirth podcast audience now surely want to read Life After Breath and also connect with you. Your significant healing gifts and your elevated insights filled with such compassion and grace Thank you, Jake, from my heart for sharing your light and your wisdom with all of us today. And here's a reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. As I like to say, to be continued Many blessings, and bye for now. <laughs>